Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which as usual has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with Sony and the PlayStation 5, or more accurately, the controller for the PlayStation 5, most likely, although not officially confirmed yet, known as the DualShock 5. Since the original PlayStation launched in the mid-90s, with the exact release date, of course, depending on the region of the world that you were residing within, Sony's basic philosophy for the design of the controller has remained consistent, with square, triangle, X and circle, L1, R1, all being present in every single design of the controller, with the PlayStation 1 and its control pad morphing into the dual analog design, which is a lot more familiar to players of today. The PlayStation 4, though, did introduce the concept of the touch pad within the center of the controller and its usage has been mixed with developers. Some third party studios have just not used it at all and some of Sony's first party studios haven't exactly used it to its maximum potential. But still it's there and a report is going around the internet currently that Sony's next generation PlayStation will have a controller which is very very similar to that of the PlayStation 4 controller, but maybe with a few subtle tweaks here and there. There is some confusion whether perhaps Sony will continue to push the touch pad within the center of the screen and maybe turn it into a touch screen. There is some ambiguity there, but let's just be honest. Generally speaking, the resiliency of a touch screen isn't quite up to par of a touch pad. And you've also got the issue then of, well, having to look down. And it was kind of the Achilles heel of the Wii U. Like, keep doing that every time that you want to uh, play a game is not exactly conducive to a smooth gaming experience. But there are reports, of course, going around the internet that Sony are really pushing backwards compatibility between the PlayStation 5 and its older brethren. I did recently uh, cover a report that there has been a patent found with one of the filers being Mark Cerny, who is, of course, the lead, ar lead architect excuse me, for the PlayStation 4. Essentially, what we have here is the ability for the console, at least if Sony implements the patent, and don't forget, a patent being filed and implemented are two totally separate things. But with what we know about the patent, it has the ability, or rather the PlayStation 5 will have the ability to spoof the ID of other CPUs of older generations. So, while the PlayStation 4 is almost a certainty with the x86 architecture of the PlayStation 5 remaining because of the uh, Zen Plus processor or Zen 2 processors, once again, some clarification is going to be required for that. Although we do know it supports a uh, Navi-based GPU. So there is a lot of crossover there with the older generation of PlayStation, whether it's the PS4 or PS4 Pro, with its AMD Jaguar x86 cores and its GCN-based uh, GPU design, which is, for the PlayStation 4 Pro anyway, quite similar to that of Polaris, with a couple of Vega, Vega features thrown in there for good measure. So in other words, backwards compatibility with the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5 were pretty much guaranteed from the get-go because one of the big criticisms Sony did face going into the PlayStation 4 was lack of backwards compatibility between the PS4 and PS3. But with the patent we've seen and a few other murmurs on the internet currently, it would appear that it's not just the PlayStation 4 that Sony are uh, trying to support uh, with the PlayStation 5, but also older consoles as well, including the PS3, PS2, and PS1. I will be interested if there's handheld devices that Sony choose to support, such as, let's say, the Vita or the PSP, which would be pretty awesome. I never actually owned any of those systems, but from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but from my understanding, there were some outstanding titles on those systems. So for them to support this, and then I would imagine that most of these games would then be available to purchase, uh, let's say, for the PSN store, or even better if you could just simply plonk in your PS1 disc into the PlayStation 5, which would be amazing. Although it would also do very interesting things to the um, 
to the games market with retro gaming being so popular for a while there with 16-bit gamers I can only imagine what would happen if uh, Sony were able to support physical media for let's say the PlayStation 2 on the PlayStation 5. I'd be very interested to see what that would do for the used games market. Although my guess is that it would most likely just be supported via the purposes of uh, digital downloads. But for Sony to do this, it will be a critical part of their strategy against Microsoft with rumours, of course, that the next generation Scarlet will be very similar architecturally to the PlayStation 5. And we can almost guarantee that the next generation Xbox will be backwards compatible with the Xbox One, and therefore we can also assume it's going to be backwards compatible with the 360 and original Xbox, although I would be interested to see whether Microsoft make the emulation even more robust with more titles than what is currently available uh, being uh, made backwards compatible. Next, moving on to the Radeon 7 graphics cards. So the Radeon 7 GPUs launched with fairly mixed reviews, but one of the ways that AMD have taken a lot of criticism over the past 24 hours or so is the fact that the BIOS of the GPUs lacked UEFI support, which was a rather interesting oversight from the company, and that's putting it mildly. However, AMD, to their credit, have quickly responded to these criticisms and have said that they are sending out updated BIOSes to their AIB partners, yes, but also there will be a one-click updater available for end users, that means you and I, that will update the BIOS and therefore uh, basically fix the oversight that AMD had with their system. It will also mean that your computer, assuming you're using a Radeon 7 GPU, obviously will boot slightly faster because it can do so in UEFI mode, plus as well fix the other issues of not, well, supporting UEFI. In just over a month's time, we will see GDC take place, and it's an incredibly important event for the industry, as we all know. But it might also provide fascinating insight into the Zen 2 microarchitecture, along with the Ryzen 3000 series of processors. In fact, for the Ryzen series of CPUs, optimization is of course key. Developers have had years, decades of experience with Intel hardware, but when it comes to Ryzen, the architecture is very new. So we've seen subsequent tweaks and optimizations from software developers along with AMD themselves drastically improve performance in gaming. In fact, there's actually a news story doing the rounds right now that uh, Blizzard have updated uh, World of Warcraft, and with Ryzen CPUs, you're looking at around a 35% increase in performance, which is not to be sneezed at. 35% is pretty damn impressive. And obviously, if you're doing raiding and have a lot of stuff going on on screen, a lot of spell effects, blah, 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 that could certainly be very handy indeed. After all, latency and low frame rates while you're raiding and trying to do something like tanking, not the best of experiences. But GDC 2018 will also provide us possibly some insight into what AMD are doing with the underlying architecture with Zen 2. We have had some ideas already because AMD have provided some uh, of the uh, the inside tweaks into the architecture. AMD have revealed that we're seeing wider bandwidth across the various processor cores. We're seeing improvements to branch prediction. We're seeing improvements to just a wider uh, pipeline, which should mean that floating point performance is around double that, at least in theory, compared to that of the previous generation. And yes, I'm glazing over some of this stuff because, well, we've discussed it so many times uh, before. And I'll try to link those videos in the description of this one. But, there is a GDC panel hosted by AMD, which should be very interesting indeed. The panel is titled AMD Ryzen Processor Software Optimization, presented by AMD. And we will get a, quote, glimpse of the Zen 2 x86 architecture, gain insight into code optimization opportunities and lesson learned with examples including C and C++ assembly, hardware performance monitoring counters. I don't think we're going to get updated information concerning, let's say, the core count for the Ryzen 3000 processors, but what we will do, of course, is have at least some understanding of perhaps some of the underlying changes and tweaks that AMD are implementing with the CPUs. 
Person, with that said, while I am of course excited to see final performance numbers for the next generation Ryzen processors, along with information concerning the specifications, I also really do like just looking at all of the evidence and making predictions and just kind of talking with all of you and figuring out exactly what AMD's plans are, because I think that's kind of part of the fun with this particular hobby. That's just my personal opinion, though. And while we're on the subject of AMD, let's discuss their support of DLSS type of technologies. NVIDIA have, of course, pushed DLSS along with ray tracing for their touring range of graphics cards. As a smaller side, Battlefield 5 has now been updated so you can enjoy DLSS with the title and that can be combined with ray tracing, which should, in theory, drastically improve performance results. And we also have uh, DLSS support with Final Fantasy 15. And finally, we have uh, Port Royale, which is, of course, uh, the benchmarking software. So it doesn't exactly take me long to go through the list of titles which support DLSS. And to NVIDIA's credit, uh, the company will be hosting a GDC panel where they will be going through further optimization strategies for both ray tracing, DLSS, and so on with games developers. And of course, I did also cover recently that they are putting out a series of books, or rather ebooks, which will also be published in hardback form to once again improve uh, developers' understanding of ray tracing. But right now, the number of titles which do officially support DLSS and are released often on the ground. Yes, they're coming, but right now that doesn't really help you. Uh, AMD recently conducted an interview with a journalist at CES. I've forgotten the chap's name. I'll put a uh, annotation on the screen. But anyway, uh, they did say that Radeon 7, technically speaking, would be capable of running compute-like functions and running DLSS. Although they did say that the performance was impressive, they didn't really say how it was achieved. We can assume it was some type of asynchronous compute, but they didn't really say what impact it would have in game-like performance, uh, sorry, game uh, application, and what type of performance impact it would have with other uh, games, which, for example, would really heavily use compute anyway. Whereas with NVIDIA, we know that they've got the tensor cores and the ray tracing cores, which in theory anyway do help to mitigate the performance impact on the rest of the GPU, although of course it does eat things such as memory bandwidth. But uh, recently AMD have put out a statement which essentially says that they are not really that focused on DLSS right now because of, quote, harsh scaling artifacts, and it would instead prefer to pursue more well-known techniques such as uh, SMAA and other anti forms of anti-aliasing, and would also like to continue the pursuit of uh, more widely adopted industry standards such as DirectML, which kind of makes sense from my point of view. I don't really uh, have any qualms that open standards are the better way to go when it comes to the gaming industry because obviously it means that anyone can just be like, hey, I've got this really cool idea, let's help fix this. I personally believe that DLSS is a quite a cool technology and I think for certain games it does work rather well. The other fact is, as well, it's not really just a form of anti-aliasing. The idea here is that you're running the game internally anyway at a lower resolution and that it is up-sampled to, let's say, 4K. So, for example, you would be running the game natively at 1440p and it would be upscaled to 4K. The results are not perfect, though, and I'm not going to uh, say otherwise. There are definitely artifact slash scaling issues present, especially in particular scenes. But I do believe that this is going to improve over time. Do I think that it's going to be the silver bullet in graphics to really make uh, games perform like drastically better? Probably not, but I think it's going to be a tool or at least an option for gamers. And if it continues to improve, just like anti-aliasing, like the first uh, an early implementation of anti-aliasing was not exactly the best. Even when we saw FXAA, there were issues with FXAA when it was first implemented, and then we got more advanced techniques later on. So I feel that NVIDIA will probably improve things and the tools will get better. But I kind of like uh, DLSS. I don't think it's perfect by now uh, at this 
stage by any means, but I do think that AMD will continue to push machine learning for its own GPUs, and most likely this will also be a factor with Navi as well. So I don't think they're ruling out uh, a DLSS-like technology, they're probably wanting to just perfect it. That's kind of what I'm getting from this. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. It would be enormous if you did. Like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.